It's been described as the climate change paper so depressing it's sending people to therapy. Its author describes it as a research paper concluding that climate-induced collapse is now inevitable. It's become the intellectual underpinning for people like Extinction Rebellion when they tell children they may die young. It's Jem Bendel's paper on deep adaptation. Does it bear up to scrutiny? Let's have a look. My name's Malin Baker. This is the Malin Baker Show for Changemakers. When he was asked his opinion on the merits of Jem Bendel's deep adaptation paper, climate scientist Michael Mann gave just one word. Crap. As arguably not a wholly formed argument in refutation, but it's probably a reference to the fact that Jem Bendel's paper is positioned as an academic paper. He describes it as a research paper that concludes climate-induced collapse is now inevitable. And yet it clearly lacks the qualities expected of a scientific paper, as we'll see. It makes contemptuous claims without evidence. It aims to engage people emotionally, more like a polemical text than a scientific paper, which may actually be why it's been so successful with a non-scientific audience. It makes no significant contribution to thinking, and most tellingly, it was rejected for publication by a peer-reviewed journal, prompting Bendel to simply publish it himself. So, OK, just because it's not in a form that makes it into a scientific journal doesn't mean it may not have good arguments. So let's canter through it. This is the five-part structure he lays out. One, to identify paucity of research on collapse and reference to that which exists. Two, summarise most important climate science and how it is leading more people to conclude that we face disruptive changes in the near term. Three, explain how that perspective is marginalised within the professional sector, quote, and so invite you to consider leaving mainstream views behind. Four, outline the way people on relevant social networks are framing our situation as facing collapse and how these views trigger emotions. Five, outline deep adaptation agenda. That is a weird structure to support a paper which is intended to show that imminent societal collapse is inevitable. There seem to be some reasonably obvious gaps. If I were structuring a document on that topic, I would have thought that the logical structure would be something like one, identify factors that make current society vulnerable to collapse from climate change. Two, identify recent research or document your own research that demonstrates such collapse triggers are inevitable due to mainstream understandings of climate developments. Three, identify the likely form such a collapse would take and stages of progression. Four, specify preparatory actions to build resilience and capability into your response to that scenario, your deep adaptation agenda. That, for me, is an obvious structure. You need to make your case for the first two in order for the latter two to be required. But we have to work with what we've got, so let's work our way through it. First, we have described an extremely cursory, frankly lazy account of some half-hearted research into whether the literature deals with climate adaptation or societal collapse. Summarised like this, search through literally two sustainability journals for articles on climate adaptation or collapse. Find next to nothing. Then do a search on Google Scholar on climate adaptation. Find 40,000 referenced articles. Decide not to review any of them. End of research. Incidentally, I also tried to search on Google Scholar on the term societal collapse. Returns over 400,000 hits. Societal collapse environment returns 326,000. However, Jem concludes that there is, quote, a paucity of research that considers or starts from social collapse due to environment catastrophe. And he moves on to the next task. Well, that's a shame. We'll be quoting one of the papers he didn't bother to look at later in this video. And if you're thinking that it's possible this was not a description of what an academic would recognise as a literature review, you'd be right. But he's moving on. Let's move on with him. Next, he's reviewing some of the latest information on climate change. Should be quite a long section, but he streamlines it handily. I will draw upon a range of sources with a focus on data since 2014. That is because, unfortunately, data collected since then is often consistent with non-linear changes to our environment. How often? What percentage of peer-reviewed papers meet that criteria? Sorry, don't know. 
Non-linear changes are of central importance to understanding climate change, as they suggest both that impacts will be far more rapid and severe than predictions based on linear projections, and that the changes no longer correlate with the rate of anthropogenic carbon emissions. In other words, runaway climate change. Proposed non-linear changes still require evidence, of course, and none of the mainstream science is predicting runaway climate change. But then there's apparently a reason. The IPCC is too tame. This international institution has done useful work but has a track record of significantly underestimating the pace of change, which has been more accurately predicted over past decades by eminent climate scientists. Wait, what? Which eminent climate scientists? Are we talking about scientists that have developed a specific climate model that you think has been most successful? In which case, identify the model that gives us the ability to review its structure and parameters. Or are you talking about the opinionated predictions of individual scientists? And on what basis is that any kind of submission? Everyone can pick individual scientists whose opinions match their own. Later on, we see Bendel do exactly that. One of the most eminent climate scientists in the world, Peter Wadhams, believes an ice-free Arctic will occur one summer in the next few years and it will likely increase by 50% the warming caused by CO2 produced by human activity. This isn't a scientific paper he's referencing, but Wadham's book, A Farewell to Ice. It's not obvious why Bendel decides to crown Wadhams as one of the most eminent in the world. It's a technique I've seen people on the exact opposite side of the discussion, people like Tony Heller, use for their favoured scientists as well. Indeed, people who have analysed the typical techniques of the people that Bendel would label as climate deniers say that amplifying the voices of the outlier minority is a standard tactic. Not that outliers are never right, but their claims should be backed with evidence. In this case, it seems that Bendel is looking to make an argument from authority, but his authority doesn't have that stellar a track record when it comes to predictions. Wadhams first predicted an ice-free Arctic in 2001. In 2007, he predicted the Arctic summit sea ice would be gone completely by 2013. And then in 2012, he forecast that it would be gone by 2016. He's often quoted as being on the alarmist side of scientists. None of that means it's not on the cards to happen at some point in the future, but cherry-picking individual scientists, particularly outliers, whose view matches your argument isn't the same as reviewing the literature. Not to be mistaken for quoting scientific research. When we look at the selected elements of climate change that Bendel covers, some is straightforward stuff that we know, other parts are more speculative. Like some of the Extinction Rebellion speakers, Bendel focuses in on a couple of areas. First, loss of albedo cover in the Arctic. Albedo is the reflection of radiation from the white reflective surfaces of the ice. As the ice disappears in the Arctic, less heat gets reflected, more gets absorbed. Mind you, as the planet warms, it's also likely there'll be more tropical cloud cover, which would provide more albedo, but Jem doesn't mention that. Second, the potential for increasing methane release. But recent research has talked down the excited speculation of massive methane releases. Neither issue is to be ignored. Both of them are serious issues, but neither of them is thought by the mainstream to be runaway climate change tipping points in the short term. Bendel's review of climate science turns into a series of known potential problems with uncertainties attached to most of them, all strung together. And he then finishes this sector like this. Nothing is certain. But it is sobering that humanity has arrived at a situation of our own making where we now debate the strength of analyses of our near-term extinction. Wait, what? How do we jump straight to there? It's like he went, here's a thing that's a problem, here's another thing that might be a problem, and here's another thing that'll be a problem one day. But we're not sure how much or when. We add them all together, and what do we get? Near-term human extinction. Really? He goes on clearly getting into his stride, but the evidence is mounting that the impacts will be catastrophic to our livelihoods and the societies that we live within. Our norms of behaviour that we call our civilization, may also degrade. When we contemplate this possibility, it can seem abstract. Well, no, the words I would use would be without evidence, as in utterly speculative. Sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. On he goes. The words I ended the previous paragraph with may seem, subconsciously at least, to be describing a situation to feel sorry about as we witness scenes on TV or online. 
that when I say starvation, destruction, migration, disease and war, I mean in your own life. With the power down, soon you wouldn't have water coming out of your tap. You will depend on your neighbours for food and some warmth. You will become malnourished. You won't know whether to stay or go. You will fear being violently killed before starving to death. Yep, seems like a solid academic article to me. Don't know what people are moaning about, to be honest. So what is the mechanism that brings the power down, exactly? I mean, for an extended basis. We have a heatwave, uh, sea levels rise, pushing people back from the low level, coastal areas. What brings the power down? Why would water stop coming out of your tap? If it did, why wouldn't the community organise to distribute waters to the areas affected? You'll depend on your neighbours for food and some warmth. Why do my neighbours have food and I don't? Why don't I have warmth? Did climate change blow the roof off my house? It's all very evocative, but I'm not convinced this scenario has been fully thought through. These descriptions may seem overly dramatic. Some readers might consider them an unacademic form of writing. Yep. Because you're advancing an argument without even rationale, never mind evidence. He then goes on into a section about how emotional we should be feeling about it all and how a bunch of people go into denial and write about how we shouldn't spread such negative things. I can imagine this is probably a key section for drawing in the non-academic readers into experiencing the despair the author intends to provoke, but I'm still waiting for some specific argument and evidence to accompany the suggestion that societal collapse is on the cards. Bendel talks about how organisations are in denial. He says, the third factor influencing denial is institutional. I have worked for over 20 years within or with organisations working on the sustainability agenda in non-profit, private and government sectors. In none of these sectors is there an obvious institutional self-interest in articulating the probability or inevitability of social collapse. From where I'm sitting, that simply reflects the fact that nobody has made a convincing argument that near-term social collapse is on the cards. Organisations wouldn't articulate the probability or inevitability of social collapse if they didn't think it was probable or inevitable. I'm still waiting for Jim to deliver. Maybe this next bit. If we allow ourselves to accept that a climate-induced form of economic and social collapse is now likely, then we can begin to explore the nature and likelihood of that collapse. That is when we discover a range of different views. Some frame the future as involving a collapse of this economic and social system, which does not necessarily mean a complete collapse of law, order, identity and values. Some regard that kind of collapse as offering a potential upside in bringing humanity to a post-consumerist way of life that would be more conscious of relationships between people and nature. Brackets Eisenstein 2013. OK, finally a reference. Eisenstein 2013. But it turns out this isn't a scientific paper, it's this book. The more beautiful world our hearts know is possible. Brackets Sacred Activism. By all accounts, an inspirational book, and it sounds very spiritual, but not what we're looking for in the way of academic evidence. Then others go further still and argue that the data can be interpreted as indicating climate change is now in a runaway pattern, with inevitable methane release from the seafloor leading to a rapid collapse of societies that will trigger multiple meltdowns of some of the world's 400 nuclear power stations, leading to the extinction of the human race. Here he references Guy McPherson, known as the most extreme outlier on the catastrophist side. In the mid-2000s, McPherson predicted the end of civilization due to peak oil. It won't have escaped your notice. We're still here. Lastly, he moved on to climate change. If your perspective on the end of civilization is resting on his words, you might not want to sell all of your belongings to finance the blowout end of the world party just yet. There's a growing community of people who conclude we face inevitable human extinction and treat that view as a prerequisite for meaningful discussions about the implications of our lives right now. For instance, there are thousands of people on Facebook groups who believe human extinction is near. Well, yes, and there are thousands of people who think climate change is a conspiracy by the UN to introduce world governments. So what? There are hundreds of thousands Utterly convinced we never went to the moon. Why are we talking about this? Then Bendel speculates on the timetable for collapse. The current data on temperature rise at the poles and impacts on weather patterns around the world suggests we are already in the midst of dramatic changes that will impact massively and negatively on agriculture within the next 20 years. 
Impacts have already begun. That sense of near-term disruption to our ability to feed ourselves and our families and the implications for crime and conflict adds another level to this discombobulation I mentioned. Should you drop everything now and move somewhere more suitable for self-sufficiency? Should you be spending time reading the rest of this article? Probably not. Should I even finish writing it? Probably not. Some of the people who believe that we face inevitable extinction believe that no one will read this article because we will see a collapse of civilization in the next 12 months when the harvests fail across the Northern Hemisphere. They were wrong. You should have gone and put money on it. They see social collapse leading to immediate meltdowns of nuclear power stations and thus human extinction being a near-term phenomenon. Certainly not more than five years from now. If you try and create a text to promote panic without any evidence whatsoever, that's it right there. Social collapse leading to immediate meltdowns of nuclear power stations. Those are just words in a sentence that don't describe any sequence of events that make sense. Eventually you realise there is no academic rationale here for believing in near-term collapse, not presented in this paper in any case. There is no analysis of how such collapses have happened in the past and what would be the circumstances to make one happen today. It's just speculation on the principle of social collapse and then nuclear meltdown. That paper I mentioned that Jem didn't bother to consult in his research actually covered this point with real research and analysis. In his paper, Collapse, Environment and Society, Carl W. Butzer looked at the societies which collapsed in history with environmental factors playing a significant role. He found that there were more things in play than just the environmental factors. In other words, Poor leadership, administrative dysfunction and ideological ambivalence appear to be endemic to the processes of collapse. War or climatic perturbations possibly served as triggering mechanisms, but environmental degradation does not appear as a universal variable. In his summary, he said something that I believe to be absolutely crucial to this discussion. However, a historical model cannot simply be applied to contemporary problems of sustainability without adjustment for cumulative information and increasing possibilities for popular participation. Between the 14th and 18th centuries, Western Europe responded to environmental crises by innovation and intensification. Such modernization was decentralized, protracted, flexible and broadly based. Much of the current alarmist literature that claims to draw from historical experience is poorly focused focused, simplistic and unhelpful. It fails to appreciate that resilience and readaptation depend on identified options, improved understanding, cultural solidarity, enlightened leadership and opportunities for participation and fresh ideas. And that of course is absolutely right. It may well be true that civilizations of the past always ended at some point, but a lot of things have changed. This flowchart from Butzer's paper shows two things that are relevant. One is to do with the timescales. Although people have this idea of civilizations just suddenly collapsing in very rapid fashion, in actual fact the process spans decades and usually hundreds of years. And secondly, the different pathways the society takes depend on its resiliency. Those old agrarian empire-based civilizations had all sorts of failure points that we've consigned to history. In those early societies, if there were subsistence failures, the rulers would generally leave the poor to their fate. Well, we may have many problems in our world today, but we have generally a very different approach. Our society has better technology and knowledge, has traditions of innovation and global cooperation, and has more democratic structures and mechanisms for removing leaders who fail the test. All sorts of things that were not in place in those civilizations that met their downfall. Anyway, what about the final bit of the paper, the bit that's going to map out the agenda for deep adaptation? Bendel says, It is not my intention in this paper to map out more specific implications of a deep adaptation agenda. So why even have a section on it then? So the whole substance of this paper was to say, without evidence, society is definitely going to collapse and we should be brave enough to have emotions about it and we should develop a deep adaptation agenda at some point in the future. I don't doubt for a moment that there is potential for civil unrest in a number of parts of the world over the coming decades. We're seeing some of those right now. Bear in mind societal collapse isn't the same as a citizenry protesting and forcing the replacement of a current government with a new one. We're talking about the social fabric crumbling and people replacing complex lives with brutishly simple ones. 
It's hard to see how, in the modern informational age, that would come to pass as a result of climate change. Sure, nuclear war or a meteorite strike could do it. It's not what we're discussing here. The only process we saw suggesting how societal collapse would take place was this harvest fail across the Northern Hemisphere, then social collapse, then nuclear meltdowns. There are a bunch of assumptions in there. One, that crops not only theoretically could fail if a wholly exceptional sequence of unlikely events struck concurrently, but they're likely to fail soon. Again, zero evidence of this. With climate change, certain growing locations will become more challenging, but there are adaptations we are undertaking to reduce the impact of those challenges. Then there's also an assumption that if a major food shortage did occur, they would be long-lasting and would create social collapse. Generally, extreme weather events that we see are temporary, and a freak conjunction of catastrophic events in strategically important areas would certainly be temporary. The idea that the world we live in wouldn't work to get food to those that needed it and get through the crisis by pulling together, I don't see the basis for believing that that is inevitably going to fail. Yes, if people see shortages in a country that they believe is the fault of the government because it's corrupt or it's incompetent, you may see process in the street, maybe the downfall of the government. Even those circumstances don't describe societal collapse in the form that they mean it here. We've seen mass starvation under Mao in China. We've seen peaceful revolution in the Soviet Union. We've seen famines in Africa with the most awful consequences. None of those led to the social collapse that Bendel is positing. So why then, when suddenly things get a bit sticky, do we assume the population of Europe will look up from their iPhones and set about brutally murdering each other? Several organisations have put forward scenarios painting the picture of societal collapse. These have tended to be given very short shrift by the scientists. So, for instance, the Australian think tank, the Breakthrough National Centre for Climate Restoration, produced a report exploring how human civilization could collapse, which was written up as new report suggests high likelihood of human civilization coming to an end starting in 2050. This was dismissed by numerous scientists. For example, Richard Betts, professor at the Met Office, said this is a classic case of a media article overstating the conclusions and significance of a non-peer-reviewed report that itself had already overstated and indeed misrepresented peer-reviewed science, some of which was already somewhat controversial. It appears that there was not a thorough independent check of the credibility of the message. But Jem Bendel pointedly fails to show that such collapse is likely. Indeed, he doesn't even try. He just takes it for granted and suggests you should too. He encourages you to engage your emotions when it might be better to engage your reason. And the paper has been used as the underpinning for a catastrophist viewpoint that has led a lot of young people being told that they might die young. In May this year, Jem Bendel said on BBC's Costing the Earth, We saw in the summer of 2018 that disruption to agriculture across the Western Hemisphere. That's the new normal. We're going to see more of that and worse. Once people are going hungry in the West, normal life is going to break apart. For context, here's the figures from the Food and Agriculture Organisation. His disruption is that small dip last year. Nobody starved. This year, the forecast is we will finish the year at the same level as 2017 and 47 million tonnes more than last year. So the old normal, not Jem's new normal. Wheat is up 4.5% from last year and at a record level. So it's not time yet to pay good money to go on a retreat in Cumbria with Jem to work out how to fight off the predators with guns when society collapses. Jem Bendel's paper plays on the intuitively obvious but wrong. It's time it became recognised for what it is which is exactly what Michael Mann said it was.